go to Hoosick Falls. You couldn't do it by train. Like oh, you could do it by train, but it was, uh, well, I, you could get to Hoosick Falls by train, and yeah. I think Victoria did, because she, she, she boarded in Hoosick Falls for the first, maybe part, at least part of her high school days. She boarded in Hoosick Falls with the cousins. She stayed with the cousins. She had okay. cousins there, the Percy's. Uh, but, uh, but before she graduated, they, they hired this car. Um, it, was a, it was a Pierce Arrow touring car. I mean, oh, that's boy. Was. Pierce uh, Arrow. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, with the funny headlights. Yeah, uh, and they paid their own transportation. And, my, and the first year I went, that was 1931, 32, two, three, four, five, yeah. Uh, we, we paid our own transportation and, and, and well, there were There were five of us. Camelia Neaton and Elizabeth Gilcher and I, and then Doris Rosenberg from the farm on the flats, and uh, uh, Pearl Morgan, whose father drove the bus from North Petersburg. We all, and, but this, by then, uh, Fred Nichols was the uh, school trustee. He had been for quite a long time. And he then lived in the Hart's Hornets. That okay. He was the trustee, and he had his ward, niece and ward, uh, was just about getting ready to go to high school, and she was going to have to go to high school on the cup. And the, he and his wife were very protective of this child, and uh, they didn't want her. They wanted her well taken care of. So uh, he was really the driving force between getting a school bus. So they bought a school bus, and from the time from then on, from while I was in high school, we had a bus. It was, oh my God! Now, when you think of well. Things must have been not nearly as dangerous then as they are now, because this bus had had uh, seats with open backs, sort of like wagon seats, up and, uh, uh, going facing the front. And then along the sides, uh, under the windows, there were benches. Oh boy! And well, a great sport uh, among the boys, if you been, if you were fool, so foolish, a girl, and so foolish as to sit on the bench. Yeah, it was. It happened that one boy, if there was a space, would push you from one end of the bus to the other, and the other boy up the end would push you back. And I can remember that. It, I don't remember that it happened to me, of course. But I probably did, but I can remember seeing it happen. Now, can you fa can you imagine how dangerous that would be now? We I never mean, thought of it as dangerous. Well, no. It's and if we, uh, we, of course, we couldn't stay for uh, for activities after school. But then uh, you band, you didn't, there wasn't a period for band practice, and I was in the band, and you had to do that after school. And all kinds of activities. Basketball, you didn't practice, the teams didn't practice during school hours, they sure. practiced after. Everything was after. So that you were on your own, sort of, uh, for, uh, for extracurricular activities. But my father, once a, once a week, came and got me after band practice, all the time, all that time. But uh, uh, when we, after we got the school bus, on Wednesday afternoons, we stayed for the matinee at the movies. And we was 10 cents to Where see the Where was the movies at the... The movie was, uh, I guess the, the theater's gone now. That was on Church Street, uh, sort of halfway between Thorpe's and the firehouse. Okay. Uh, the new theater. <laughs> <laughs> That, that uh, the new theater, I don't, there had been an old theater, I don't know whether it was the same building, but it had been renovated to the movies. Well, they did put, uh, have stage shows there, too. But uh, I, my mother tells about going there uh, to see operettas, and uh, that was the, uh, I suppose when it was, that was an opera house originally. Right. If, if I'm not sure it was that building that was on the same site, but that's what it was. But Mama told, uh, she, she, would tell about going there with my father, and sh she and my father and uh, the Halls went once, and my mother <coughs> began to <coughs> at clear her throat in the middle, and my father asked her if she wanted a cough, uh, lemon drop, and she said yes. So he gave her a lemon drop, and uh, afterwards she found out that it was that he had had only one, and that he gave her one he'd been he'd <laughs> partly used. So she gave me that as a terrible story. What you know, stories to frighten children. All never always be sure that somebody else hasn't been chewing on, chewing on your lung drop, <laughs> or chewing on the gum. <laughs> yeah, or gum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ter terrible tales for Todd's. That now, when, when did the switch came with most of the children from Petersburg then going to Berlin? That was way, way later. It was in the 60s, wasn't it? Or oh yeah, uh, it was after after Molly. Let's see, Molly graduated. 
in six, um, from the Berlin School in 63. And people were still going to, but she had gone to grade school there. It was, in the, it was in the 60s. I can't tell you the exact date, except that I do remember we decided that it would be better to send her to the, uh, to the central school when she was in about, and she, when she was in second grade, and that would have been in 1952, I think. That was still District 4. But we sent her to the central school because we thought it would be better for her. And uh, uh, so she went there long before the districts integrated. Some other children did too, but we had to pay tuition there. And uh, I think it was very, it was very near the time she graduated from high school that uh, we had paid school tax in District Four all these years and paid tuition to send her to Berlin. And just about the time she graduated, uh, we started paying Berlin Central school tax. So we felt that we had timed things just very, yes, be very beautifully that way. So I think it would have been in the very in the early '60s that. Uh, that District four finally, it just became impossible to right. to, uh, to keep a separate district. But feeling was very very strong, very Try strong. To keep the, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was very strong to keep a keep a Petersburg school. And some people think that that those um, that that strong feeling between Petersburg and Berlin went back to the baseball teams, but I think it went back before that. I it's my personal feeling that it went back to the to eighteen five and earlier. I tend to agree with you on that because. Uh, uh, it's obvious that what's now the village of Berlin was always the uh, more liberal, the more up-to-date part of town, uh, even when it was all Steventown. I'm sure that that was the, that was the center. That well, was always the center, and when uh, that's why that's uh, it broke off in Steventown because it was too big for Steventown. You see, and then and the whole north end was one. Then it, that continued, but but what's now Petersburg Village grew too, so uh, Berlin wanted to split off from that. And I'm sure that Petersburg resented when uh, that Berlin uh, wasn't right. any going to be any more part of Petersburg. Well, I and think I also think the line was right, was right really, and tell me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. through oh, what's now okay. center, what's now center Berlin. Oh, I think that's correct. Because yeah. it yeah. was right north. Um, Petersburg really was everything north and of I, Peter Simmons I know, Farm. I remember we were talking about that one yeah. day that with uh, Peter Simmons was probably of why, where it came, Petersburg was what was north of, His of farm. Peter's farm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's very probably correct. Uh, so, but I do think that's where that the bad feeling between Petersburg and Berlin yeah, began. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, of, uh, of course, I don't know anybody who remembered back that far. The people I remember uh, were remembered the baseball teams and what yes. tremendous rivalry there was to, to win <laughs> the baseball games. And of course, the Hull brothers were uh, you split between both teams. So, and, and uh, it would be kind of fun to have, uh, have a picture, I think, of, oh, in, yeah. in, in the book of, of one of those baseball teams, uh, uh, and, and maybe a Berlin team, too, because, of course, the halls were big, and uh, always stand out. We, 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 we have several pictures like. of baseball teams, so, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with mm -hmm. some captions on them, yeah, like, you know, yeah. five, well, five, five against Berlin or something, oh, you yes. know. Well, Victoria uh, remembers a great deal more about the about baseball than I do because it's right the behind house. Was, yeah. yeah, they owned the her, her father owned, or her, and later her mother owned the the land where the baseball games took place, the island as it was called. Exactly, I still want to go down there sometime and just yeah. poke around. You know, it's well, still not much yeah. to see anymore. But uh, no, there is not. I think I don't know whether the little cabin that was still there or not. But I'm sure the tennis courts are all gone. And but you know that it has one great hazard, poison ivy. Oh really? Oh, it has the most. Luxuriant beds of poison ivy, I think, in the world. Well, I'll go down there. I, I, I do all my exploring in the, when this time of oh, year, yeah, anyway. Well, so, uh, well, this Henry, you managed to get poison ivy in the middle of winter down there. Oh, okay. On a sled. So, <laughs> so yeah, he went through the snow. I, I suppose, as he told, as he tells it, he did. Okay. Now that that's. Uh, now, do, uh, were we were we on anything when I got? No, I guess I guess we could move ahead to just. Um, to ask you, when were you town clerk? And uh, when I was town clerk. Well, let me see. Or how did you get the job of town clerk? How did clerk? I get the job of town clerk? Well, sort of by default, I think you'd say. Uh, mostly because, um, well, there have been kind of the first political, not the first, but the first political upheaval, shall we say, in many years. Uh, there had been in the 30s, there had, 30s, the late 20s, there had been a rift in the Republican Party, the North End against the South End. 
Dr. Hall against Harry Green. But that was all over, and the Republicans were again won, and had been for many years. Yeah, Roosevelt must have helped with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, yes. And uh, Petersburg was still, as I said, about, or about 85 or 90 percent Republican, enrolled Republicans. Uh, but Harry Brown uh, married Marion Brown, and he was from Steventown and a Democrat. And he decided to run for supervisor on the Democrat ticket. Well, a, a Democrat hadn't been elected supervisor in forever or to any town office in, in, within my memory. But Harry Brown did his homework. He went on, he rang sufficient doorbells, and he had a feed store. So he knew the people up in the, on the hills. And it was good friends, and had, you know, had been able to do favors. And I presume probably he carried accounts uh, for quite a number of these people. Uh, and anyway, he got sufficient, uh, uh, I'm, I'm wrong. I, I told you something untrue. He ran for town clerk. Okay. First he ran for town clerk. He managed to win town clerk. And ignominious. He ran against my mother, who was his aunt by marriage. <laughs> Mama didn't really want the job, but it was kind of going begging. Clarence Wells, who had been town clerk for years and years, had died. And uh, Victoria had filled in. But no, she didn't want the job. And uh, so this is in the 1940s. So this late was 40s. Uh, 19. 49.50. Right. Thereabouts. So my mother agreed to run. She didn't really want to, but she agreed to. But uh, Harry Brown did his homework better, and he won. Well, he, there was a Democrat to the town clerk. So uh, lo and behold, the next time he ran. Uh, now, I sometimes get details wrong. Victoria's better on details, and lots of other people are than I am. But I, I'll get the, the gist of the story. <laughs> but but uh, my grandfather, Babcock, added uh, fancy work. I try not to add fancy work, but I do remember wrong sometimes. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, uh, the next time around, Harry, instead of running for clerk, again ran for, for supervisor and, uh, and won. But he, he was town clerk, and they had to have the, the Republicans had to have somebody to run for town clerk. And I believe that's when I ran for town clerk. Now, I might have the timing just a little bit wrong, but it was, I think, 1954-56. Maybe there was somebody in there between. Oh, yes, Elizabeth Gilcher. Her husband had died. She was the one who, to, who, who after, got the town clerk after Harry Brown, when he ran for supervisor, Elizabeth Gilcher was a widow, recently widowed, and that was a sure thing. Okay. Uh, she ran for town clerk. Oh, that's before she met Ed, then? Or oh, yes. Before, oh, she, okay. was, yes, I, before right. she met Ed. Her first husband today. And she, so she was town clerk. Well, I don't remember whether that was two years or four years, but in the meantime, Harry Brown became supervisor. And Elizabeth didn't want the job anymore, so they had to get uh, somebody to run <coughs> on the Republican ticket. And uh, I think it was Vic Neaton who ran on the Democrat ticket. But anyway, I ran for town clerk and won by a very small margin. Because the, the Democrats, you see, had got big, they had really done a whole lot to elect first a town clerk and then a supervisor. And the things were never quite so solid after that. But uh, the first, uh, I went out to Elizabeth's and picked up the things, uh, the town clerk things, and brought them home and put them in my kitchen. And uh, that, uh, the kitchen was the obvious place in that house because everybody came to the kitchen door. Nobody would thought of going to any other door. Where were you living then? We were living at the house next to Victoria's, okay. just below Victoria's, yes. Phoebe Sands. Yes. And if people came across the, the porch there that faces the, the road, next to the road, and right into the kitchen. And I had, we called it the town clerk, and it was a three or four drawer filing cabinet that we purchased, my Henry and I got at Monkey Wards. And then there was a smaller filing cabinet that the town furnished, but uh, we, we got one. And there they sat, and we, I did my business at the kitchen table. There was no town hall then? Or, uh, oh, there was a town hall, but that was the old schoolhouse. Right. Okay, that was the already oldest, the town the hall old, then. Okay. The old district four schoolhouse was the town hall. And uh, where, where uh, there was an office in there, but it, all, it had uh, nothing but a, uh, an oil stove uh, space heater. Oh, The co pot burner type, you know? Yep. And uh, it was only fired up uh, once a month for town board meetings and for election and special occasions like that. Which I always remember it in the winter because of, it was that awful smell. And I had been on the town on the on the election uh, board, and that was interesting too. Before I was town clerk, that you had to get there at five o'clock in the morning, 
and because the polls opened at 6, and this she did, for, I think, about four times a year, two uh, uh, registration days and, the, and election day. And uh, we had to get there at 5 o'clock, and the, the stove would be smelling to high heaven, and it would be freezing cold. And the polls opened at 6, and uh, 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 there was a woman who lived just a bit down the road who always wanted to be the first to, first to vote. And she, she never seemed to understand that one member, there were two Republicans and two Democrats, uh, one person had to vote on the, on the election board, had to vote in, as we call it, had to be the first person to vote. That was really to check the machine, that the machine right. was going to work right and everything. She was always mad. She'd say, and especially if it was a Democrat, she was a Republican. If it was a Democrat, we, took, we tried to take turns voting in. Uh, if it was a Democrat did it. She was always mad. She said, them Democrats, they always get in there first. And <laughs> she probably just saw the uh, row A, she probably... Uh... <laughs> well, th th we, we were row A then, because yeah. all during that time, uh, Republicans had a Republican governor, so we were, Republicans were row A while I was doing that when I was down there. And, and we were lot, well, there were lots of, lots of interesting things that went on as a member of the election board. There were a few people who uh, needed assistance when voting, and we always wrote down eyesight. But we know, really, that it, there were several of them was because they couldn't read. But we never put that down. We always put eyesight. <laughs> there were only three or four. Right. right. But they we knew really. they were. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and, and the town clerk, town clerk was, um, was, was interesting. The first day, I got an awful shock. Uh, I went to Elizabeth and got all this stuff, and of course I didn't know a dog license from a hunting license at that point. And the telephone rang, and I answered it, and somebody said, is this the opening day for varying hairs? Well, I thought it was somebody being smart. And I said, ha, 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 ha why sure, why not? And the uh, uh, indignant uh, reply from the other end, well, I, I want to know if this is the, op the, day of the season, opening day of the season for varying hairs. And I said, I'm sorry, but I don't know what a varying hair is. Well, of course, you probably know what a varying hair is, <laughs> this, uh, although I didn't. Uh, it's, a, it's a rabbit, I guess, who is yeah. one color in one season and another color in another season. Well, I didn't. But I found out. That was my baptism. And the thing that we specialized in was, 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 what, was marriage licenses to people from Vermont and Massachusetts people who, for one reason or another, didn't want it published. But they were being married, because, of course, in Massachusetts, you had, were, they had to publish bands. It had to be uh, in the paper. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and um, I don't know about Vermont, how Vermont law was, but I know that I gave licenses to an awful lot of people from Benmont Avenue and down in that area. And uh, many of them were very young. Okay, so this, uh, 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 it may have been uh, that also may have been a factor. Uh, in New York State at that time, uh, women uh, could marry without parental consent at 18, and and men at 21. And I think it may have been in in these states they it may have had to be a uh, girl may have had to be 21. Or the, the law was You're right. was probably different. So, that, uh, and it may even have been simply cheaper to get married. New York State. Uh, I yeah. don't know what the reason was. But anyway, we got well, maybe, a lot of out-of-state business. Maybe they thought Petersburg was romantic. You know? <laughs> well, uh, I don't I, I, <laughs> Maybe, but I'm inclined to doubt yeah. it. But if you look through the marriage register from the 1930s on, you will see that a tremendous, uh, when Bert Simmons was town clerk in the, in the 30s, a large proportion of the marriage licenses were issued to people from Massachusetts. That's funny. That's, uh, yeah. Uh, and that was depression times, and, that, and maybe, it, maybe it was cheaper if you went or to New York State and just got married. If you did it at home, maybe you'd have to have a big church wedding and you couldn't afford it. Right. Uh, you know, there probably were all kinds of reasons, sure. but certainly, uh, there, it, and the, the, uh, we had almost had a Mary and Sam, <laughs> uh, the, the uh, ministers and the, and the uh, justices of the peace cashed in on this, too. So, so it was it was a it was a marriage center. It, I shouldn't be surprised if it happened all along the border, maybe in the border towns. It, it happened in uh, earlier. I found out since I lived here in Bennington, uh, a whole lot of uh, Petersburg people were married in Palma 
O'Connell, who kept better records at the New York State earlier, uh, I found a lot of Petersburg people who were married, from North Petersburg, who were married in Connell. Oh, I should go look at that. That's, um... Well, I, uh, I, I, they probably got more than I copied, but whenever I found them out here in the museum, I, I copied them out, these uh, mari the marriage records yeah. of the people from North Petersburg. But they're, uh, they're not spectacularly early. They're, they're like 1890s and after. But, oh, okay. It's, uh, not, it's not earlier not, stuff. Not uh, really okay. early. No. Because I, no, I noticed that with uh, just Petersburg town records that there are whole big missing sections. I mean, mm -hmm. we're missing town minutes all over the place. Is so. that so? Is that from, so? From, from, the May, from a good portion of the 19th century. Is, uh, uh, is that so? So. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I can, uh, see, Elizabeth kept him, we had a, oh, it was a darndest book, a loose leaf book. Awfully hard, and of course I didn't type well. And the town board, Elizabeth had used a typewriter, but they told me not to because they didn't like the sound of the typing. And we had to uh, complete the minutes during the meeting, and then they were read and signed right there. Oh, you that wait till the, the next meeting. Oh, then. right. Uh, you didn't present them at the next meeting at all. It was, it was all done right up on the spot. And uh, something to be said for that. But, uh, uh, well, yeah, there, were, there was no question about remembering right. things. Probably did. Uh, that was town, town meetings were kind of fun. Town board meetings were kind of fun. The part I didn't much like was uh, the hunting license. Of course, I'm not greatly, uh, not a great fan of hunting and murdering animals, yeah. small animals. <laughs> uh, and the deer hunters were the ones I really didn't like. I, I felt I couldn't face being one more year of deer stories, uh, following the blood through the woods, and he got my deer. I, I really didn't like that. Otherwise, being town clerk was quite fun. And then you became town historian right after that? No, right? uh, uh, at the no, same time, at the, during, the, during the time I was town clerk. Carl Hakes had followed, I believe, Clarence Wells as his turn. Right. And Carl died. And uh, I had, at that point, I had become, had been, become interested in genealogy. And I never really did get much interested in any other kind of town history than genealogy, because I was hooked. And, uh, but it was kind of an obvious thing, uh, since I had the, the town custody of the records and they needed a town historian. Uh, so the, and then I remained historian for a long time after I stopped being town clerk. Then, as I say, well, once again, all I really ever did was the, was genealogy. Because uh, you were town historian right up through... Until so. Rich Weaver. Uh, well, I know, when, when we moved down to Coon Brook, 66, 66. 1966. Uh, I was still a historian, and I was I remained historian for a while after that. And Harley Church was town clerk, because and I remember substituting when he went to Florida once. I to, I did assist assistant town clerk, but um, it was I think probably in the late 60s that I decided it was I was outside the village, and I didn't know the name of everybody's dog anymore, and uh, the population was changing, and I felt that I was. I was not sufficiently at the center of things to even uh, pretend to keep up on town history. And I, and I thought it was time somebody who had an interest beyond genealogy did some town history. Right. So, uh, which we were, was interested in the job and did a lot. Oh, yeah. Sure. You, he, did, he, did, uh, he did. He took up a lot of things, did a lot of things I, that I should have done and didn't. No, he, he collected so many things together. It's just fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, right. It's the, I guess we can move on. I guess uh, I don't know. Interesting events in town trivia. <laughs> Anything that comes to mind? Oh, yeah. no, my my mind is. That's what stuff. my brain is full of. Uh, town, town. Well, trivia. one thing I wanted you to quote again was was you were talking about um, uh, something that Olney Church said when he was driving, or, or oh, something I else said about Olney. Oh, I don't know if I can tell. Uh, I don't know if I can tell. And 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 I, this is apocryphal, I'm sure. Oh yes, I, I, I'm taking uh, it. Back. But it was. Um, uh, let's see, here comes Alney, right through the brook, never touched the bridge. Uh, uh, bent up the Flanders, uh, busted the windflector, and put a great big hole in the renegator. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, I guess, he, I, I was, I guess Harold Brock was telling me that Alney was not uh, the best uh, <laughs> No, oh, he was, oh, his generation of, of car of drivers. <gasps> oh, I remember many of those. And, uh, Oh, golly. 
there were lots of terrible drivers. And of course, although we knew everybody in town, I had a great long list of people with whom I was not to get in an automobile because they were such terrible drivers, not because they were dangerous in any <laughs> other way. And uh, my Uncle Class was one of them. My mother said, don't get in the car with Class. He will go, you'll land in the ditch and get killed as sure as anything. So, and, and I was always so embarrassed because I would sometimes meet him on the street and he'd offer me a ride and I'd have to say no. Well, that's uh, tough for a kid. And my, my, my grandfather, Moon, who uh, was a horseman, and uh, he had trained horses and uh, bro broke horses. Uh, uh, I don't know whether how to say that grammatically. Anyway, <laughs> he had, to say he had broken horses all his life is, uh, sounds kind of funny. But anyway, uh, he uh, rented land by the railroad tracks in order to, when he, when he broke a, was breaking a horse for somebody, rented land near railroad tracks because he didn't own any there, uh, probably from an arms bee, and uh, let the horse run there for a while so he'd get accustomed to trains, oh. the noise. And that was one of the things. Uh, but he himself never got well accustomed to automobiles. He owned one, eventually, but he tried to, uh, he tried to control it by saying, whoa, God damn you, which <laughs> was his standard way. <laughs> and once, uh, he, the, the barn, he had a very, very nice horse barn. It, and like... It's still standing? Or? Yeah, oh yes. Uh, still in condition, I think. So as you went in the front, uh, you, uh, there was a dirt floor. And uh, that's where you drove the wagons in. And uh, the stalls on each side for the horses. Then uh, up, a up a step or two, and uh, that uh, beautiful, beautiful oak floor, and that was the tack room, and uh, uh, where they kept the surrey with the fringe on top, and, uh, and any other carriage that, were, that was worthy of it. Uh, and the wagons, the, cor the ordinary buggy, uh, probably stayed out on, on, the, the, on the dirt floor. <laughs> but uh, uh, my father, my grandfather uh, gave up, had to give up horses. He got arthritis so that he couldn't, he couldn't get into the wagon and he couldn't, and he was kind of discouraged with life anyway. But so he got a car and my father was uh, kind of unhappy when he did because he knew it would never work. Uh, and as I say, his method of applying the brakes didn't. And <laughs> once he, he he would remember eventually what you were supposed to do to stop, but it, uh, it, he always said, oh, whoa, first. This one time, he drove into the barn and <laughs> didn't get to the brake in time and went right up into where, up the step and into the surrey. And it was only by the mercy of God that he didn't go back, out the back of, down to, was out the side hill with the pigs, pigs, there was pigsty under it. It's a mercy he didn't go right down and up through the back of the barn and if he had a modern car, he probably would. This is a place on East Hollow. No, uh, this is Hill Hollow. I mean Hill Hollow. Hill I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so after mostly, uh, he hired uh, the son of uh, Jess Maxson's son uh, down the road to to take it when he wanted to go out of town. He wouldn't have he wouldn't have dared drive. Unfortunately, driving Troy. So when when he needed to go to Troy, uh, he hired Leo Maxson to drive. How, how much movement was there between Petersburg and, and like Troy or Bennington or you know? Well, uh, um, a lot. Uh, it seems to me like a, a quite a lot. Uh, now, my grandfather, for instance, did uh, he did all his banking business, and and uh, and sold a lot of his produce in uh, Williamstown and North Adams, but that was because uh, the the family roots in Petersburg went back to see on the east side. So they go over the pass all the mm -hmm. time, or, or mm -hmm. they go through Powell? Mm -hmm. to do no, that? over, over the, uh, right up the side of the mountain. Somewhere in one of the old town books, uh, there's, uh, uh, there was a, uh, somebody tried to sue the town, or there was some kind of law business about it, because uh, they were talking about the state of the road. Up, uh, it went almost right straight up, almost like where the, 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 the telephone, those telephone lines. Or a ski square, the old ski now, square. Yeah, ones, right. Yeah, well, before that, it was, it was uh, Long distance lines, I think, right. went through there. Uh, the road went right straight up the side. Oh, it didn't curve around no, like it does no, now. No, I mean, no, no, no. Oh, wow. No, it was, uh, was a, the shortest distance, practically the shortest distance between two points. And somebody lost uh, the horse, lost, they lost a load of flour. 
That must have been quite a mess. And uh, it all spilled down the hill. And they said it was the state of the road. The horses skidded on, slid on the road. And I, I, don't, they, I don't remember if they said the horses were injured. But they lost a load of flour anyway. Uh, going, going to Why, it must have been horrible trying to, the horse guy. I mean, uh, do they have any, you know, oh, yes. thank you ma'ams or whatever yeah, you call yeah, them. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, I think it was a lot of it was just sheer, just ledge. Uh, it, it must have been a perfectly dreadful road. I, I never went over it myself. That, that's before the night. It was in but the 20s when they, when they built the current yeah, trail. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was, uh, of course, that was quite a, that was quite a nine days wonder, too. When uh, they used to talk about air pockets. Well, of course, that was, that, there's, that's, there's no sense to that, I guess. Uh, but I believed it at the time, and lots of people did. Um, I think it was the Model T had a little difficulty going up hills because of the position of the gas tank. Uh, now I might be I might not uh, have this I'm just right. I remember this also. Okay, go ahead. Uh, but of course there were some places that were kind of steep, and it was it was high. You know, I mean, it really really went up over the mountain, and it felt it felt it was very very steep going. And the car would you have to sometimes have to shift it down into low to get up there and sometimes it would just conk out well they said it was well it, they said it was because of these air pockets that's that, right i can't have heard that that's, that's <laughs> the, the atmosphere was so thin at that uh, high altitude <laughs> but uh, i guess it was really probably the position of the gas tank that had more to do with it i i don't know because uh, i i remember once uh having the car just wouldn't go and they turned the car around and backed up the hill and it made it Okay. So I so think it was something about the feed line. Must have been. But, uh, and of course, uh, that it, one thing that hasn't changed is the fog. Coming, it could be right. very, very foggy up there. The trail. Do you remember anything about that? That that um, yeah, that happened. I guess 1917 or 1916. So it was before. It would have been before you were born. But the mm -hmm. story of that mm -hmm. that girl who got real distraught and, and oh, shot yeah. herself. Oh, yes, uh, yes, yes, mm -hmm. where, Now, where that happened on what... Um, uh, I think it happened... Uh, uh, like now, near Victoria, where the reservoir is? Or? I think so. Up by Aunt Sweet, is the way they oh, said okay. it. And now, uh, there's something that I would, uh, I would like to get corrected in many people's minds. Every so often, I've seen it written, A-U-N-T, Aunt Sweet. And, but that isn't correct. The man's name was George Anson, A-N-S-O-N, and he was called Ants, A-N-S-E. Oh, okay. So it was Ants Sweet. Ants Sweet. Yeah, but that George, but, uh, George but almost uh, it's become corrupted to be to be yeah, Ant Sweet Hill, but it but it, it that's not right. That that's the house that has a little the, um, the pointed window. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now was he related to like Charles Sweet? Oh yes. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, 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 he was brother, I think, to uh, to Charles, old Charles, sweet. The one who served in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that's uh, mm -hmm. right. So and that and yeah. that's where that. And their father Luther had built Luther Jr. had built the, that uh, and what became Aunt Sweet's house. Oh, right. So Charles would have grown up in that house then when he was young. I so I believe so. Probably. All right. That helps in. Mm -hmm. Now I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, once again, that would be well to check that with Victoria because she might. We might have slightly be more accurate, but I think that's correct. Uh, you could pretty well figure out well, I, with the, in the sweet genealogy, but I yes, have so a, I'll, that's just always had the generations just straight in my head. So when that happened, that was and, and this girl who did this was she originally from Petersburg or was she? Oh, yes. Uh, she was. Uh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, there it goes again. It just stopped. She was a. Ray Clark, of course, he lived many years after that, but uh, I think it colored his life. Uh, I would show you sure, because he was, he was young when he was. Happened. Oh, he was uh, hardly more than a child, like 17 or 18 yeah. years old, and she was somewhat older. And she was in her 20s. It was just so, one yeah. of those terribly unfortunate things that, that uh, would happen to him. Now, who, who was the other old fellow who lived up um, where, where the uh, Bursteins live now? Oh, that been. was George Smith. Well, he's by way of being was by way of being a cousin of mine. His mother was uh, was um, let me see. His, <laughs> he had, he had moon great grandparents. Uh, 
So uh, we, uh, I had I call him cousin. Um, and the place where he lived had belonged to Joel Moon, who was a, co a connection of his. But but George Smith was an interesting character. Uh, he was um, not interested in following the ways of, of the world. He did as he pleased. He lived as he pleased. He lived in the big over, in big overalls in summer, and uh, was not particularly worried about being over clean. That was not the sort of thing that worried him. It, he, it didn't seem to do him any harm, but he hit, he's another one. Uh, uh, never married, lived with his mother as long as she lived. And, uh, and, and uh, his mother, had, he had got that place after Uncle Joel died. That's another one who had lived with his mother as oh long boy. as she lived. His, that was, well, it wasn't, it was George's Uncle Joel, yes. Uh, another old unmarried man who had lived right. with his mother in Billy Burstein's house until, he, until, of course, until his mother died and then until Uncle Joel died. They said Uncle Joel, uh, who, I don't know what the reason was, but just the way he did it. He, he milked his cows wearing a tailcoat and a stovepipe hat. Oh, that's interesting. And, well, he, and he died in about 1917 or so. Okay. Uh, so you see his clothing was old fashioned. And um, Petersburg was full of characters. I mean, you don't, we don't have, I guess, characters, except maybe me, anymore. But every, uh, everybody had a, had a character of his own. And George Smith, whom we were talking about here, he was, he was ingenious. Uh, he, he, well, he had a still. That was a practical necessity. But uh, he also uh, needed, wanted electricity. Well, that was long before the farm. Uh, electrification, farm, electrification, you, yeah. 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 Um, so he, th there's a book with a little fall in it. He made a little, what do you call it? Dynamo. Hydraulic, yeah. Uh, dynamo, yeah. yeah. And uh, got enough electricity to, a light for a light bulb or two. I don't think he could have run a toaster, maybe, but uh, he had light, <laughs> yeah. his own light. And he just did it all, all, in, all himself, strung it all up. And I bought, bought some wire and some light fixtures. And no, he had a bicycle that he, he rode and, uh Oh, yes, yes, that was his transportation, was bicycle. And, and uh, he would go to Troy with his bicycle. And one thing he always did, in the spring when the shad ran, he would always go to get the shad and, uh, and, uh, and come home with a huge bucket of shad. Oh, boy. And, and he kept, when we, we bought, the house after he after he died, we, we bought the, the place and kept it until we sold it to Billy Burstein. But uh, George is, nobody, George had been dead for quite a while, uh, but some of his things were still there. That is the things that nobody had wanted were there, were there. And one of the things nobody wanted, and we really didn't either, but we, and to clean out the house, we had to, we had to take care of it, was his pickling barrel. <laughs> and, um, one of the things that separated the old way of living from the new way of living, was, excuse me, was what in, went in, what meat went into brine. Uh, a man who used to run a store told me, made me aware of this. Uh, what now becomes hamburger used to become corned beef before the automatic grinder. Right. The, when there was a piece that was too tough or anything else, you threw it in the, in the, in the brine and it became corned beef. Well, George Smith, uh, had lived by on, on a farm, and when they butchered, you had to preserve the meat. You smoked, either smoked it or you or you kept it in brine. So uh, uh, he lived that way all his life. And when it uh, he got older, and, he, and it was troublesome to go to the village, and maybe he always did it this way. I don't think he went to the village every day ever. People just didn't. Yeah. But he would buy like a week's or a month's supply of meat, and what he couldn't eat before it spoiled, he put in a barrel. Well, when we got there, this barrel had been around for an awfully long time. And, well, we had to get rid of it. And, and it was, uh, the barrel wasn't in awfully good condition and it was pretty full. And we had to, uh, we had to get it onto uh, some kind of conveyance and take it, well, we polluted the brook, I guess, is what we did. <laughs> But we had to do something with it. It was biodegradable, I assure you. Yes. It was biodegraded to quite a considerable degree. <laughs> Marion Brown was with us that day when 
and, and her stomach revolted. Because he had been already, you said he'd been dead for Oh, a he'd time. been dead for a long time, yes, <laughs> uh, for months, uh, maybe over a winter or something. When, because um, uh, he had, uh, uh, let's see, well, he had, he had uh, accepted no help while he was able, but uh, uh, he had no, no, well, he had a half-sister, but she was far away, um, and, he, and he was in the hospital, and uh, in county, the county was looking after him when he died. So uh, they acquired his property in payment. Okay. And it was uh, up for tax sale, and that's how we got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I guess the last question is um, on something on whatever you run on um, Aaron Worthington. Uh. Because I remember you telling some well, good stories about him. Well, yeah. Um, they, they, of course, they're all second-hand stories because I don't I don't remember anything particular about him. Um, they're in the. I think it's the Harwood Diaries, down in the museum. Uh, somebody, f and I think it was either Harwood or Day, M Harwood, must have been Harwood, um, took a trip to Petersburg looking for uh, people to come, for a young, young women to come, a young woman or perhaps more than one, to come and do housework in Bennington. And was highly indignant that he couldn't seem to get any young Petersburg women to want to come to Bennington to work for somebody else. And, uh, but he eventually, went into the hotel, and there he said, there sat old General Worthington. Uh, and he kind of describes uh, him a little bit uh, condescendingly, I thought. But I don't know why, except that, uh, of course, Vermonters tend to be chauvinistic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but uh, I don't remember hearing any particular stories about, about uh, General Worthington. Uh, Except I know he, uh, that he was he was there, and the, Worthing, the Worthingtons seem to have owned the territory, which um, later held the churches, the three all three churches. Right. Now, because this day, do you know any more about the the tale that he arrived with just you know on a bag over his shoulder? And well, I and don't know. I don't. I don't know that. I hadn't heard that. And also, that he uh, was a very good carpenter, and he built the whole belfry for the Baptist church. That was another story I've heard. Well, it may be true. I, I just never had. I never had to hear it, but it's, it's certainly very possible. I had supposed that the Jeremiah Allens uh, had built the Baptist church, but I don't know. I don't. Uh, uh, I had just. I don't think I ever heard anybody say who built it. Uh, but after all, everybody had access to those. I suppose they all used uh, Asher Benjamin's. Or drawings, oh, yes. or or someone of that ilk. They, they probably, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just was able to get a copy of that Asher Benjamin uh, Country Builder's Assistant. Yeah, is that great? That's yeah, great. it's yes. a great little book. It's, it's, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, you can see you can see those those houses. You can see the church. The bones of them are, are there. So, uh, so uh, no, I don't I don't know that. The Worthingtons seem to have been more numerous in Grafton. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, I, d I didn't know that until I got Grafton Cemetery records, and there were a lot, a lot of Worthingtons in Grafton. Well, that's again the problem we run into, mm -hmm. is you can't just look at Petersburg. That, it's got to be Grafton. Oh, it's oh, it's, be oh Vermont, yes, you cannot Vermont, separate. Uh, yeah, You're not so. separate. I have some uh, Worthington genealogy. Uh, uh, well, it's, it'll, it's in the, I've written, written down the little bits of it and the family, with the family stuff. And I don't remember offhand, but I have the name of the, of the first uh, Im immigrant from the family, and then uh, the first ones who came here, or some of the ones who came here. Well, we're just about out of tape with well, the last. Well, uh, <laughs> we'll be sorry you ever <laughs> ask me a question because I seem to talk, even though even though I may not say much, as, as my father used to say, talks a lot, but don't say much. <laughs> well, it's good Petersburg. Uh, Wisdom. <laughs> yeah. yes. Well, the best stories you can never tell. Exactly. Sadly, the best stories you can never tell.